everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you today on important considerations for GEO's community's role in digital transformation. My name is Biliana Anicic. I'm an enterprise architect helping organizations with their digital transformations from strategy to implementation. I'll be speaking to you briefly about challenges and opportunities um, brought by COVID-19 in terms of digital transformation. So let's get started. What can I tell you in the next 30 minutes? I'd like to talk about past, present, and future of digital transformation. Um, then expanding more on our new reality, uh, new needs for predictive insights, coupled by unprecedented amounts of data and computing power available to us. And in the end, I will be connecting the dots, uh, talking about people, data processes, and technologies participating in digital transformation. So, some of you remember Jon Snow, not this Jon Snow of the Game of Thrones, but uh, Jon Snow, the father of epidemiology. Um, Jon Snow, um, he was able to save quite a few lives by using more innovative methods of plotting data. And uh, basically he lived in, in London uh, in 1854 during London cholera pandemic. And he was able to, just by correlating uh, the instances of death uh, in one neighborhood uh, and having also uh, data available on water pumps in that neighborhood, he was able to determine the real cause of, of cholera in, in the city. It was considered that it was a noxious disease uh, <laughs> transmitted by air, but in fact, it was actually waterborne. So again, saving uh, a lot of lives. Um, so Jon Snow uh, did this sort of plotting uh, those dots on a map. And, and presently, we're doing something similar, of course, with more sophisticated technologies and visualization tools. But uh, the recent past is not that different from uh, basically his era um, from the perspective that um, we're not talking about prediction. We're not able perhaps to, to have huge insights. Um, but let's see what, what can change uh, in the future. Um, so Jon Snow was all about forgotten. Um, not really uh, didn't get, get get much credit for for saving all those lives but recently actually epidemiology and also geomatic students are uh, or were flocking to to london there's even a, a pub bearing his name and there's a haunted walk uh, john snow's the uh, haunted walk uh, why am i saying this this is just to kind of make this grim situation a bit lighter but um, this means that uh, we can build upon the great achievements uh, in the past and, and all those uh, great tools that we've been using. Uh, digital transformation will bring newer insights and by leveraging people, data, uh, processes and technology innovation. So I would propose that using that holistic approach, and I've been uh, using that approach with uh, different uh, government departments, um, that is the, the only way to, to have sustainable uh, digital transformation. Um, many digital transformations fail because one of these aspects are not considered. So what is digital transformation? Let's uh, answer this basic question. It's really going from paper processes to data-driven insights. So, you all remember how we kind of used to drive, you know, uh, you know, the passenger would, would help with navigation, uh, looking at a paper map. Um, it wasn't ideal. Uh, we wouldn't know uh, where the north or south was. Uh, cars didn't have that function in the past. But now it's, it's just, uh, it means that all this information and more is all connected and, and available on our, uh, you know, 
uh, phones or, or in our cars. And uh, these kind of insights are just, uh, you know, uh, we all have access to. So imagine how it is to, to make a decision uh, based on stacks of paper, or briefing notes, or, or what have you. Uh, it is so much easier if you have search function and if the data is digital. So really kind of the, the stark difference between, you know, paper world or analog word, world and the data world and digital. So again, uh, just, uh, just for fun, uh, just to highlight how digital transformation was aided by COVID-19, uh, people realized the need to, to have access to their, uh, you know, work and, and processes and, and data remotely. Um, there's this kind of uh, who led the digital transformation of your company uh, that you probably have seen, but it's, it's really applicable here. A, CEO, B, CTO, C, COVID-19. Uh, many people selected covid um, digital transformation used to be kind of a, you know, nice to have, but now we're looking to, we're, organizations are really looking to, to change and, and COVID really accelerated that change. I'm not sure if you have noticed that in your organizations, but uh, departments that I'm working with have definitely seen that. So what is happening presently? So drivers for change, uh, there were many in the past, uh, like right now, uh, the mobility and connected society um, data, uh, unprecedented amounts of data, but also COVID-19 uh, was a big driver for change. So how can we leverage this situation with uh, you know, mobility and, and the, the fact that we're all connected with uh, unprecedented amounts of data and technology uh, computing power available. So in terms of uh, GeoCommunity's role, uh, there's a huge role for GeoCommunity to play because 80% of data um, has a location component, but only 10% of it is used. So something to consider. Um, and so this can really help with bringing new insights um, for all sorts of different applications. So location will be key to many of these um, sort of retail, autonomous cars, smart cities, sustainable development, real estate, defense, environment and climate change, transportation, financial industry, but really also for public health. And how is that happening right now? You all should be familiar with uh, Johns Hopkins' um, Coronavirus Resource Center. Um, this particular dashboard has been featured in many news outlets from CNN uh, to, to all the others. And it was actually proven as, as one of the most um, effective ways of communicating this very nebulous and difficult situation for, for most people to understand. Uh, just in terms of numbers and a map and dots on a map um, and obviously the curve, uh, whether it's gonna be flat flat in the next few days or not. So it helps with a bit of prediction, but it also, it, it's excellent for showing the, the current situation. So this was instrumental for, you know, governments, first responders, but also uh, the medical community and, and citizens as well, because they were, they were being informed um, in an easy to understand fashion. Um, this, uh, the technology behind is, as you, probably know is uh, Esri's ArcGIS and but you know here and uh, Esri Living Atlas as well as um, Slack, GitHub and uh, AWS were leveraged as well. So it's a combination of, of commercial and open source and technologies and there's there's cloud component to it as well. So these opportunities extend not just to the public health realm, but also to different industries. So um, let's uh, talk about some of those uh, in more detail. So just to give you a bit of an update, um, Government of Canada uh, has responded fairly well uh, to uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. And uh, 
while the you know digital transformation is underway for government of Canada, um, the government was uh, just a few months and, and I guess several years before uh, this, these developments, government of Canada was focusing on workplace mobility, which is great. Now people are able to work remotely. Um, cloud first strategy, um, cybersecurity, ethical AI, high performance computing, um, all with the goal of enabling innovation and economic growth. Uh, now, of course, the situation is different, but all these uh, initiatives and digital transformation in general um, have helped uh, the government to, to be efficient. So, for example, uh, you know, CRA and uh, together with Service Canada uh, were able to uh, solve many problems and, and actually provide assistance to, to many Canadians in the times of, of uh, this crisis. So, um, some interesting apps, uh, niche apps um, available to us um, uh, with, of course, uh, some geographic distribution, so with a map as well. Um, uh, so different uh, COVID-19 resources. Uh, I'm sure you've used uh, some of them, including the uh, web-based self-assessment tool on, on symptoms, um, as well as, uh, you know, there are mental health and other, uh, you know, open call initiatives, and uh, as well as, uh, you know, wage safety calculators and, and so on and so forth. So niche applications became the, the preferred way of delivering this information, but also for collecting the information. So in more sort of general terms, there are new opportunities for new insights uh, for all sorts of organizations. This is more like a smart city type uh, application, but uh, cloud with uh, unlimited computing power and you know cheap processing and um, you know ability to compile data from different sources is also interesting. Also, data comes from all sorts of places uh, now. Uh, we're all generating uh, huge amounts of data: uh, media, imagery, sensor, earth observation, health and habits, location data, and of course, there are algorithms, uh, analytics, and AI, and so on. So how do we tap into these possibilities? How can we leverage this situation for enabling digital transformation of, of our governments and our organizations? So I would propose that a holistic approach considering people, data processes, and technologies is required. In terms of people, I would like to highlight a couple of groups, uh, geomatic specialists and uh, data scientists. Um, who will be combining skills from often disjointed uh, areas and uh, of expertise, for example, geomatics and, and sociology or medicine. Um, those individuals will be very important for not only interpreting the information, but also assisting with decisions. Um, so um, there are unprecedented amounts of data, but it's untapped due to various limitations. And if we remember 80% of, of data has location components, so there are opportunities for our, for our geo community for sure to, to participate in this sort of these next steps and stages of digital transformation. Processes, um, process automation, um, implications for sustainable development, Spatial analysis, policies and standards, all that is, is very important. So uh, in terms of technologies, we already mentioned, uh, but I would like to highlight, uh, we, we mentioned cloud, IoT and so on, artificial intelligence. I would like to highlight again, um, integration of geographical component into business intelligence processes and tools. Um, and so that particular uh, ability and capability was instrumental in Johns Hopkins um, implementation. And a couple of years ago, I wrote an article for Go Geomatics magazine, uh, among other things, uh, highlighting uh, the importance of niche apps. And that's exactly what's happening right now. Uh, niche apps are, are basically the preferred method of delivering information, but also for crowdsourcing, for, for collecting information, for, for validation as well. Uh, so those are uh, interesting um, also developments. So people um, will be key to leveraging and making use of new technologies and uh, data and insights. Um, I mentioned geomatic specialists, data 
scientists, but also enterprise architects. So for people who are kind of more horizontal or uh, holistic in, in sort of uh, in their work um, will be key to digital transformation. Um, so also diversity will be very important. Uh, data diversity, so, so having different sources of data, for example, for um, COVID-19, there's interest in, in looking at uh, hydrological data or uh, also the weather patterns, uh, if, if they have an effect. Uh, there will be many, many different applications and studies, and, and one of which is already happening with MIT and Johns Hopkins University. So um, diversity also in terms of individuals and opinions and, and uh, different uh, v ways of uh, thinking um, will be key to, to better strategic choices and decisions. And um, it, it is proven uh, the you know, MIT also um, study shows that um, heterogeneous uh, teams are more creative than homogeneous ones. So um, also uh, privacy and ethics will be of consideration, very important. Uh, for example, new technologies that bring uh, face recognition and, and others uh, will be uh, you know, scrutinized also by, by the citizens. And the key will be understanding how we can with minimum uh, amount of data used or shared um, help with you know, public health or other considerations or helping with uh, user experience. So those are some people considerations. And again, many uh, digital transformations fail because they don't consider uh, people. Data, I don't really need to get into this much because data is uh, now, there are unprecedented amounts of data available. Um, it's complex, uh, challenging, uh, completely new insights and, and specialized. Um, so the, it will be a matter of, of sort of um, bringing that data together as either data services and so on, but uh, also having catalogs that uh, obviously uh, data governance will be key in, in, in data, which is really kind of a process. So um, risk mitigation, performance insights, um, enterprise architecture will, will be key in ensuring the, that data is of known quantity and quality as well. So um, mitigating risks by setting operating standards, for example, and really kind of going from big data to analytics to decisions. And last but not least, tech. So technologies, um, there are so many different technologies available to us now. And uh, from sensors to wearables to microsensors to uh, LiDAR, high performance computing, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, twinning, autonomous vehicles, artificial intelligence, and the list goes on. Um, so um, again, niche apps will be key uh, for delivering, uh, you know, targeted applications and geospatial data and processes uh, to users and also for crowdsourcing as well and perhaps data validation. So again, uh, there are so many different applications I can show you, but um, one of which is uh, COVID control. Uh, again, Johns Hopkins University study where you can um, submit your temperature and, and help basically uh, the fight um, and, and better, you know, understanding of coronavirus and, and you know, how it affects individuals. Um, so, of course, there are some, uh, you know, ethics and, and sort of uh, privacy concerns that are mounting uh, with applications like this. But again, if, if people um, find that this will help overall and, and, and the harm is not as, uh, as high, so also security, cybersecurity will be important in this situation, uh, then, you know, that's, that could be a different decision. Um, health map uh, is also very important. Uh, this is a case where you have academia and also governments and, and private sectors working together on delivering uh, important uh, niche apps um, for managing and, and really uh, collecting information about um, 
diseases. Uh, so uh, mostly, well, different diseases, but, but actually uh, it's also used for COVID. So I don't want to get into too many details, but there are some Government of Canada applications as well. Uh, I'd like to uh, just uh, show you briefly the uh, implementation that uh, was uh, developed by uh, Mercedes-Benz and uh, what three words. Uh, if you haven't heard uh, or you don't know about what three words, I, I encourage you to look them up. They're basically a grid of three by three meter squares. Um, so that uh, for, the, for the entire planet and uh, for each square, they've assigned three words. So you can imagine how important that can be for finding a location. And there are many places uh, that are remote and don't have addresses. So having those three words for each location are key for first responders, but also, uh, you know, just for everyday users. So um, let's uh, listen to this one minute video. So this is uh, just uh, a way of uh, bringing all sorts of different information together, all kind of tied by the location. Uh, so you could see the, the weather information, uh, the you know different restaurants and the, the location, but also that grid that uh, just by, by saying three words, you, you can actually navigate to it. So if this is available uh, in a Mercedes-Benz uh, today, I can see this uh, or some of these features available uh, in many other cars. So um, you could also see how uh, voice recognition has improved tremendously. Uh, it used to be a pain and you, you, you know, error, it was error prone, uh, but now, uh, you know, there's much better chance of getting the right results. Uh, so, so this is basically just showing how digital transformation is here today and how it's already changed the way we live. Um, also for our decisions, whether we are going to walk, uh, you know, 10,000 steps one day, we, we, you know, look at our phone or Fitbit and that's kind of the nudge that can help us make a decision whether to walk more or not. So, so that's how that data and also there's the, you know, spatial component and all that um, is really useful in, in everyday lives. So it's the organizations, it's the companies, the government that have yet to change uh, or transform. So um, we are, uh, you know, there are unprecedented opportunities. Uh, the compound annual growth rate uh, is calculated uh, basically of 34% uh, to 2025 and $75 billion um, for, you know, location of things type of markets. So, so there are unprecedented um, uh, opportunities. I would also argue that this may actually be accelerated by um, the, you know, what, what's happening with, with COVID-19 and all those deliveries, deliveries are available. I would also say that um, there's the use of um, geo-blockchain that is of interest uh, for, um, you know, transport in transportation, but also uh, delivery of goods. Uh, so for location, but also for, for always having the information on, uh, let's say on a parcel where it is, where it is and, and you know its status. Um, so, so there are some interesting developments that we don't know that much about yet but are coming. Um, and so our digital future is really uh, 
interesting. It can really help with many applications, but because we were touching on, on health and this is topical, um, there's uh, also an opportunity to really, with all these different data sources and, and having all these devices, of course, uh, considering the ethics and privacy implications of, of, of this, but um, really kind of looking from going from disease through, you know, proper diagnosis to management to prediction and even prevention. So those results uh, are something that we all would like to have, but of course we also want to have our privacy and make sure that uh, only a minimal amount of information is, is used. Um, or if it's anonymous, uh, even better. So, so those are just things that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, just uh, to highlight uh, main, main points that I'd like to make is that for digital transformation and whether it's uh, enabled by location intelligence or not, which is highly recommended, um, we must consider people, data, processes, and technologies. And that's how we basically receive those invaluable insights and, and that's how we improve decision making. We can facilitate deeper understanding and also um, we can enhance uh, user engagement. With that, merci, thank you very much. And I hope you are all well and uh, I wish you health and please stay safe and uh, let's meet for some question and answers. Thank you very much. Hi, Juliana. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. So the opportunity. Fantastic. We're we're lucky to have you. For um, if it wasn't clear from your presentation, Juliana is one of the key uh, people in Canada on uh, on leadership in terms of uh, things like future trends in the geospatial sector and identifying them. I rely on Juliana's. Uh, expertise and wide knowledge to help uh, in the first year of GeoIgnite and now in the second year of GeoIgnite. So, Biliana, thank you so much for uh, helping to put all of this together. You're welcome, John. It's a pleasure. I think we're learning from each other, and uh, I'm uh, really happy that I'm able to share some of the knowledge that I've acquired over the, the long years in the industry. And um, again, grateful for for the opportunity. Thank you. So uh, we've got time now for uh, Q&A. So I would ask everybody to use the Q&A tool um, to uh, put in your questions and we're going to get through as many as we can. Um, I'm going to take the advantage of my seat and ask the first question. Um, I'd be very interested in your advice, Billyanna, if I was somebody who was thinking about um, either um, entering university or maybe I'm mid-career but looking to retrain what do you think are the hot areas uh, that are gonna put me in a good position to take advantage of the digital transformation are there any particular career paths or disciplines that you think are, are going to be quite good thanks for that question um, Interestingly, you know, we don't know what, what uh, the future is going to hold, but I can, maybe we, ha we can predict maybe the next uh, two, three years <laughs> by the amount of change that is happening to us and uh, these unprecedented sort of events such as uh, COVID-19 pandemic and or any, any other things that are happening that are not uh, something that you plan for. Um, all this aside, um, the good old sort of data understanding, data literacy uh, are key to, to any profession. So not only as someone kind of getting into the university, but also professionals that are already in uh, various, uh, you know, uh, lines of business or, or professions can benefit from 
increasing their digital literacy. And what does that mean is being able to understand data, how it can be used for insights, but also just reading, um, you know, uh, some, uh, you know, pies and pie charts and, and sort of uh, graphs or, or, or any other ways uh, in which the information can be presented. So I would say that data literacy and digital literacy as a whole um, is, is key. I would also say that um, combining your existing knowledge, so whether it's like, you know, really finding your own niche and what you're good at um, uh, is, is also key because the world needs, uh, you know, creative thinking, it needs uh, different ways of thinking. So that diversity is, uh, is really becoming uh, more and more important. Um, I would also say that um, niche apps that I've mentioned earlier, so development of, of niche applications will be key to delivering insights, but also again for collecting the information. So everyone is on their phones, so, so looking at more sort of more mobile way of presenting the information, but also collecting the information. And Sorry, I can talk about this forever, but uh, maybe that answers your question <laughs> for now. <laughs> uh, that was great. Thank you. So let's go to the audience now and uh, share a little bit. The first question is from Dennis Haynes. Uh, thank you, Billyanna, for your interesting and visionary uh, visioning presentation. How do you see the role? Uh, I guess there's two, two parts to this question. How do you see the role of crowdsourced data and information in the digital transformation? And secondly, how do you see the level of quality and integrity of crowdsourced data managed and monitored and understood by users versus authoritative data and information? So um, thank you for that question, Dennis, Denis. Uh, it's, uh, it's very important to understand that uh, sometimes uh, some data is better than no data, as long as you know uh, it's uh, you know, quality or currency and accuracy. So metadata along with any data will be key. So even if you're talking about crowdsourcing of sorts, uh, you have to make sure that you're also providing uh, metadata elements that need to be gleaned from either, you know, the, the instrument that is collecting the information or, you know, the cir circumstances, the date and so on and so forth. With that, you will have a much better uh, sort of, understanding as to when the data was created, what, you know, what it can, what, what were the, the circumstances, because as you know, um, with crowdsourced data, you often are dealing with people that are not necessarily uh, understanding why even they're collecting that data and uh, they're not maybe the professionals, uh, although companies are now using in the field uh, sort of data collection uh, tools. So uh, I would say that, uh, so this kind of touches uh, sort of that your, your second question, the quality, uh, no matter what the quality is, sometimes it's better to that just that it's known and you can kind of assign probability to, to any decision you ma you're making if you know that maybe the data is not of known quality, right? So you can say, I can trust this data only 20%. But it's still better than not having any data. So, so it's just about really risk management, and it's also about um, governance, uh, where uh, standards are also applied. So, if the data is standardized, you you will have a much better chance of, of knowing the again the, the whether the data is that can be trusted or or used. We have a, a practical example at NRCAN. So uh, a niche app was developed to collect uh, user information. So on floods uh, that were happening a couple of years ago. And what, what was found out is that this crowdsourcing is not only good for collecting new information, but also for validating information. So for example, you have street map and then there's a house there, but somehow someone actually, you know, destroyed that house and is building a new one. Like you're thinking, you know, it's still there, but it's not. So person on the street, on the ground, will be able to confirm that information. So, so those are interesting opportunities. I'm not sure if I'm answering your questions, uh, but 
uh, if you have a specific uh, industry or, or you're perhaps uh, thinking of, uh, maybe I can uh, give you a more applicable example. Thanks. Um, so we've got a question here from David. Uh, he's saying, uh, great presentation, Biliana. What are some of the best known commercializations of the geo blockchain concept you mentioned, especially in GIS? Um, I've, uh, I've read several uh, articles. I can say I'm, you know, I've, I took the MIT course on, on digital transformation that included uh, blockchain. Uh, we created our, our own cryptocurrency. I, I understand blockchain, what it can be used for and like smart contract, contracts, but I've never applied that knowledge yet. But from what I've read uh, about the, the geo blockchain, it's, uh, it's really exciting. Uh, there's some uh, uh, logistics as, as number one sort of uh, uh, commercialization opportunity where you want to know about uh, whether it's parcels or you know, containers uh, position, but also any information that, that uh, such as the status or, or anything else you need to know. Uh, is there and it can be independently confirmed. So the logistics is, is key. Drones, uh, drone delivery, um, but also, as I mentioned, smart contracts. Uh, uh, so uh, agriculture industry is also looking at, uh, you know, geo blockchain in ensuring uh, food supply uh, uh, for the future. So, so those are, uh, you know, applications that I'm familiar with just from, from reading about it, but I, I'm afraid I don't have, you know, experience in applying to your blockchain yet. <laughs> okay, great. So we've got a, another question uh, from the attendees. Bonjour from Quebec. Uh, what's the next step in developing location-based apps for better control and prevention of pandemics? And a bit of a follow-up, what's the right approach for mass adoption of that kind of app or those apps? Bonjour Quebec. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, that is a great question. Uh, from what I'm hearing and uh, you mentioned me talking about uh, Johns Hopkins University a lot in my presentation, uh, that place became a hub for you know both academia, public sector and uh, obviously, uh, you know, citizenry really kind of participating in, in the COVID fight. And, uh, and I forgot the, <laughs> the private sector, which is obviously uh, very important as well. Um, so interestingly, hydrological information and weather patterns are being looked at as, as being highly influential in uh, sort of the spread of COVID. Uh, so this is a new disease. So just imagine having the opportunity to layer all sorts of different data and almost like mash it up and, and play with it to, to see if there's any correlation or trends that you can glean. And of course, looking at historical data as well. So it's not necessarily, uh, you know, going after a single insight that you already think you will get. It's more like being open like sharing a lot of data, communicating, correlating, connecting the dots. And that's exactly what geospatial is good for. Um, sort of uh, providing some filtering, but also connection to, to the data uh, available, both spatial and geospatial. With that, you can have better chance of understanding the trends, but also, um, for example, um, understanding different neighborhoods and uh, uh, determining social determinants of health. Uh, working with Statistics Canada will be key and really understanding if there, there's a correlation to, you know, uh, it could be, uh, you know, is there a racial or, or, you know, ethnic connection or even age, you know, we know that there's an age uh, kind of uh, dimension uh, to uh, contracting and, and also um, for different outcomes uh, of COVID. So all this to say, uh, there are opportunities to start, like as long as we have digital platforms available and interoperability be between different data sets, scientists and, and academia 
and also private sector, as well as, um, you know, first responders, as well as, uh, you know, medical community, they can collaborate on determining additional insights about the disease and, and acting accordingly, the policymakers as well. So, so this is, I know this is, sounds really nebulous, but um, this is happening in, in some jurisdictions. Uh, New Zealand had, was, was actually helped uh, tremendously by their previously successful digital transformation. So their outcomes are much better. So you, you also asked for practical, uh, how can we almost capitalize on, on this? Um, um, I would say, uh, I would, you know, I'm more like for, for helping people uh, having better outcomes and, and but uh, I think it's, uh, you know, there's also money to be made in, in all this. So I really don't, I didn't really think about that much, but I can see that certainly there are new opportunities uh, for either new products or new processes or techniques that can be leveraged. Fantastic. So we've got another question uh, from Colleen Fuss. How do you see the future of geospatial platforms? Those, those that catalog and provide access to geospatial data, will they be more or less centralized, more or less specialized? I actually see federation. Uh, I, I see better interoperability. Uh, part of it will be centralized, uh, those parts that could be. Uh, but I would say that federation is also key um, and using modern tools such as R for, for data transformation, uh, you know, will be key to, to ensuring that data can be integrated. Also data services. Uh, so again, following start standards like ISO 19115 North American profile for, for metadata, you, you can actually do uh, consistent searches ac across your data and knowing basically, and if it's cataloged properly, you will actually be able to correlate the data better. So um, there's also um, uh, the people factor will be key again. Um, Cross-functional teams, so having you know medical professionals working together with policymakers, but also with you know developers or, or so on and so forth, that that can also start creating new insights. But it's it's really. Um, uh, the platforms, I, I, would, I wouldn't call them geospatial platforms anymore. I would call them digital platforms. And geospatial is just one aspect of it. Great, thank you. So we are uh, coming up to a hard stop uh, at the end, end of this session. Um, thank you everybody for all those fantastic questions. And thank you, Billyanna. Uh, we're going into, uh, after a short break, uh, the Maxar Elevation talk. And then after that, we, uh, so it's kind of something interesting. For the first time in the program, we are going to be going directly from one room to another room with no break in between. So after the uh, Maxar presentation, we will be joining Billyanna in a separate room for the diversity leadership panel. So if you're in this room, we'll be leaving this room. And uh, so make sure to check the schedule and get into that. That, that is um, going to be a really great discussion. So after all that, I have to say, Billyanna, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. And uh, my contact information is available if you have any specific questions. Uh, I'm a bit excited and maybe not, <laughs> maybe not coherent, but uh, just uh, if there's, you know, maybe a specific thing that you'd like to discuss, I'd be happy to. Thank Fantastic. You, Thanks. Yeah, all of all of our partner presenting partners and contact information is on the GeoIgnite partners page. You're going to find links to their websites and their social media. We're also going to be sharing with them uh, your uh, contact information for registration uh, so that they can follow up to see if you're interested in anything as well. All right, Billyanna, thank you very much. See you soon. Thank you, John. See you. Thank you, everyone.